Welcome to the next section within the eight domains, which is asset security. It's a new domain uh, a couple of years ago. However, you'll see that although this is a very small domain in the whole exam, only counting 10% of the total marks, asset security can be quite difficult because it is seems very easy, but it becomes very difficult when you have to start doing that and to automate that process. So within the asset security domain, we'll look at the following. We'll look and look at some concepts with around that, some classification in your enterprise, who owns that data, that's very important, and who can actually give grants and revoke access to that. How are we going to protect the privacy of these? That's all the assets in our information, specifically the data. How does that work across cross border flow? And then also, once we actually want to get rid of the data, how do we ensure appropriate asset retention and getting rid of that once we completed with that? The data security controls on top of that. And then finally, we're going to look at the handling procedures of that data, depending on the classification, of course. First, off the cuff, we'll look at asset life cycle. So the first step here would be, for example, asset inventory. Now, although it's not a formal guide within this asset domain. It is mentioned somewhere slightly. The NIST cybersecurity framework currently at version 1.1. I highly recommend that to actually start working through that because it's the first step they do is identify all your assets and you can go through that. Then once we've done that, we have to assign ownership to all the assets we have identified. Then once after that is done, we have to classify based on the value. And the value can be anything from exposure in the market, uh, the, the black market, and where people want to buy that as well. And once we know the classification, we need to protect the data according to that classification. And then the final step in the cycle is to assess and review. Assess that we are protecting correctly. Review if there's any access unauthorized access to that data. Now, assets can contain everything. It could be, for example, my hardware, my software, people, data, the data flow, workflow, configuration information. And it's important to understand from my data in the organization, we'll have a life cycle where we acquire the information, we'll use the information, we'll do backups, and finally, we'll have to dispose of that information when we can. First step in your organization, we spoke about previously mentioned in domain one about some of the policy development in your environment. Once we actually look at a classification policy, how the data should be classified, there is a data policy. Whereby our data policy established a sound data policy in an organization which is critical to ensure that the information is properly classified. It has an owner and define the life cycle of that data. Now, also, when we look at that data management, information management and records management all overlap and the candidate must ensure that they understand their content. Data governance on the other side applies to the people, the processes and the technologies that handle and process all that data. There are numerous attributes when we can look at the functions that are required. These include the ownership of the data, the custodian of the process, the data confidence, how well we can trust that data, how does that data conform with policy, the performance of data, and a little bit more. The data quality is critical because what it refers to is the state of qualitative or quantitative pieces of information. Now, Also, when we look at another thing called risk analysis, when we look at quantitative and qualitative, we learned there in domain one that quantitative contains where we can count something, where it's monetary value or actually every item in the data set. Qualitative is based on the assumption of certain criteria and we measure these things. Now also, data quality is the state of completeness, the conformity, the consistency, the timeliness, the duplication, the integrity and accurate, which make it appropriate for specific use. Now, if we look at the data definition here of the data quality in this diagram, we can see what Wikipedia defines it. We've got traditional encyclopedias and also the web version too. And as you can see, all those little attributes of each one and how they in interrelate to each other. 
Now, when we look at a formality around data documentation, now the point with data documentation, and there's a couple formal links here, and you can get this also on the actual website or on the documentation that you, you received with this. The ISO 2709, the information and documentation, the format for information exchange. We actually have ISO 15836, which is information and documentation, which is the Dublin Core Metadata Element Set. ISO 15489, Information and Documentation, which is part of Records Management. Now, Records Management, if we quickly want to go to that, that's really critical because we need to look at who's my librarian in my organization, what process have you got, and you need to also understand what Records Management contain, the whole process from the life cycle. We have ISO 21127, which is the Information and Documentation, where a reference ontology for the interchange of cultural heritage documentation. We have ISO 23950, the Information and Documentation, Information Retrieval Application Service Definition and Protocol Definitions. ISO 10244 is Document Management, which is the Business Process Baselining and Analysis. ISO 32000, Document Management, Portable Document Format, for example, your PDF, of course, and ISO 27001, the specification for an information security management system. Now, you don't have to know all these ISO levels and versions for the exam. Some of them you have to do, definitely, of course, your 27001. That's part of the stack that we actually look at. However, if you want to look at from a personal point of view and actually expand your knowledge in this area, I would actually suggest looking at the documentation. Now, when we look at a document management system, that's the ISO 32000, there are certain things that we will actually consider. There's metadata, which is data about data. The integration of your data with, for example, other systems, the workflow and the secure data path around that, the version control of your information, the controls that you put on top of that, which we'll look at later, We'll actually have a look at a federated search where you actually do a single search and it actually goes across multiple platforms, multiple areas to get a consolidated result for you. And then finally, the publishing of your data, the trustworthiness of that. In section 2.1, we have to identify and classify information assets. Now, also often ask if you have your asset classification policy defined, that is fantastic because you have a security process in your organization. If your enterprise, if your company does not have an asset classification policy, you, you're actually lagging behind and it could indicate that your security control or the framework is not adequate. Now, when we think about classification levels, we can think about labels. And if you think and look at the operation security side, when we look at that in the formal models, Labels actually come into the Department of Defense Orange Book at category level B. We'll look at that. Now, when we look at commercial stuff, these are things like uh, confidential, private, sensitive, proprietary, proprietary or public. Then we actually have military, which is more rigid and controlled. We have top secret, secret, confidential. We also have information, things like sensitive, but not yet classified, and then unclassified. Now, there was an executive order 12356, which is national security information, which defined users have clearance at a level high or equal to the data classification. This is where a formal process of granting access to the data by the own owner normally takes place. For example, if I've got a, a secret clearance in the military example there, I have access to secret, all the secret data and data underneath that, for example, confidential, unclassified, but I may not have access to the top secret data. Then when we look at data categorization, we can actually look at different organizations such as the NIST, which is the National Institute for Standards and Technology. There's the FISMA or the Federal Information Security Management Act of 2002. They have a compliance framework defined by FISMA and a supporting standard. Then also you can look at FIPS 199 and the FIPS 200. We'll drive a little bit deeper into that, but that actually gives me a little bit more control in how we look at data at the end of the day. So FIPS 199, that gives me that it says that the Federal Information Processing Standard Publication 199, Standards for Security Categorization of Federal Information Information Systems, is a United States federal government standard 
that establishes security categories of information system used by the federal government. One component of risk assessment, for example, the FIPS 199 and FIPS 200 are mandatory security standards as required by FISMA. When you look at the FIPS 200, this is the second standard that was specified by the Information Technology Management Reform Act of 1996, FISMA. It is an integral part of the risk management framework that the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, has developed to assist federal agencies providing levels of information security based on the levels of risk. FIPS 200 specifies a minimum security requirement for federal information and information system at a risk-based process for selecting the security controls necessary to satisfy the minimum requirements. Now, when we take these two together, we need to look at a potential impact definitions for those security objectives. So FIPS 199 gives me my categorization and FIPS 200 gives me my minimum security controls. Now, here's a table you can actually go through and see how it applies to your environment. For example, we have a security objective where we looked at the confidentiality, the integrity and the availability which is my triad, my CIA triad for my foundation of information security. That's the definition from the United States SEC 542 documentation. Then of each one of those, of the CIA, we can look at the potential impact, for example, low, moderate and high. What I would like you to do is actually take this table, go through it and understand it and how it actually applies to your environment. Then 2.1 is the identification and classification of our information assets within our organization. A very small section here, but we can define that the following must happen. We have a classification policy must exist in my company or my enterprise. There's another thing from the EU, which is the GDPR. Now the GDPR, there are links there. You can actually look at the GDPR and what it's about from your general data protection requirements. And from that, what we can actually see, specifically Section 33, is if I have a breach, how quick must I actually react to that? Uh, it is 72 hours that I have to disclose that if I have found a breach. We also have the UK, the Official Secrets Act. We have in USA, we've just seen FIPS 199 and 200. Then also uh, NIST 860, which is the how-to application of FIPS 199. And then also at a more granular level, you might have military requirements. So those are basically the guidance that we can actually take from there. Now, once those are reviewed, the next section we can go to is 2.2 is to determine and maintain information and asset ownership. Now, when we look at the asset management life cycle, we need to decide, are we going to plan and build, design, build, buy it off the shelf and so on. Specifically when it comes to software, we'll see that for a later stage. Then after that, we have to then either then procure and build. Once we've done that, we have to commission it for the end user to use. The end user will operate that. And then there's a process of maintaining, backing up the data, making sure it's correct, using the data or consuming the data. And then finally, when this is completed, we have to decommission that data. Now, when we look at the ownership, there's certain things that the owner must do or the custodian must do with the data. The asset inventory must be up to date. Stressing again, using a classification policy to classify that data, because if we don't classify that data, we don't know how to control and place security controls on top of that data. We need to authorize access based on a need to have principle. So, as a custodian of their data, it's my prerogative, it's my right and my duty to actually make sure that if somebody requests access, I will review that process, I will grant that access. And once the access is no longer required, I need to revoke that. So it is a life cycle of that data. The security self-assessment on the data and control. So as the owner, I need to make sure that I make sure the data is correct, the access to that data. We might have a security department. We might have an internal audit department, but it is the end user that knows who's got the rights, who should have the rights and actually monitor that data. Implementing compensating controls on identified security anomalies. For example, if the data 
is on a USB stick or a removable hard drive and it is classified as secret. Before it leaves this building or even when it's on the drive, my policy might state that data must be encrypted. When we look at then IT asset management, there's an ISO 19770 we can look at. Now what that gives me, there's five components in this documentation. At the moment, it's another two being developed. If you look at this first section, it's the process framework to enable an organization to prove that it's performing ITAM to a sufficient standard to satisfy corporate governance. So we're reporting to corporate governance. All those requirements and ensure that effective support for IT service management overall. So if you look at ITIL, for example, the second section, 19770-2, provides ITAM with data standards for software identification tags. Now those tags, the software tags, will make it easier when we start doing asset management on the software, the library, where are the software, who's using it, and so on. So it's trying to automate the process within a control framework. The section three provides ITAM data standards for software entitlement, including usage rights, limitation, and metrics. Cloud security, for example, if we're actually using software, for example, Adobe Acrobat, well, the whole cloud, it has usage rights. It's got limitations. I can't install it on more than two PCs. It has metrics, how often I use it. And then also section four provides the ITAM data standard for resource utilization management. How often I use that, where can I use it, geolocation, etc. And then finally, version five, which we're using at the moment, provides an overview of the vocabulary. I would recommend just handling on to that. Then change management is also critical. There are a couple of things we'll quickly look at. There's the ADKR, ADCAR, we have Lean Six Sigma, and also Plan, Do, Check, Act. I'll look at those quickly and just compare them. There's the ADCAR change management. We have awareness, the desire, the knowledge, the ability, and the reinforcements. And each one of those, for example, if we have awareness, the subsection there is to create awareness and mine through target communications in your enterprise. We have to assess the change for readiness. Are the users willing to accept the change? Because as we know, users do not like change. Engage and empower the stakeholder. Agree to the sponsorship of your roadmap and track and monitor project team effectiveness. All in the awareness side. And also, uh, all the other sections as well. I mean, take those and go through them and make sure that within your environment, this can be applicable. Desire, communicate the imperative for change, highlighting the benefits. Now, many of the projects you find in a project management, the lack of communication is your first failure and the buy-in process as well. Nobody would like to be part of a project that fails, so we need to do that. Now, when we look at that and just compare the ad car with, say, Lead Sig. Six Sigma, for example, let's look at that. Lean Six Sigma, here we can actually have, we define, we measure, we analyze, we improve, and then the control. So there's a basically a one-to-one -one relationship between the ADCAR change management process and also the Lean Six Sigma process. Then finally, another one we quickly look at is the plan, do, check, and act where you have to do establish your objectives. This is my planning process, and this process is required to deliver the desired results. Then the do phase allows the plan from the previous step to actually do those processes. Then during the check phase, all the data results gathered from the do phase are evaluated to make sure they are successful. And then also the act, also the known as the adjust phase. This is the phase where the process is improved. So as you can see from that cycle. Another important word that you need to consider is the CAB or the change advisory board. It's, uh, some of those are part of those process within organization where you sit and you approve. You go through the change control process where you can see a user does a request for a change. We look at the impact analysis of all systems. We will improve or deny, implement the change, and then review and reporting. Now, an important part of this change management process as well is the backup procedures to make sure that if it doesn't go well, if things go wrong, we can actually get back to the previous uh, status process. Then configuration management is a biggie into organization as well. There is a specific NIST 
document, SP 800-70, I would like you to actually have a look at. This is the National Checklist for Program for IT Products. Now, there's a SCAP, or the Security Con Content Automation Protocol, which actually have a couple of versions development over time. We have the National Vulnerability Database, which is in the United States, the government, Content Repository for SCAP, an example of a SCAP implementation available. You can uh, look at that. There's a thing called OpenSCAP we can use, and it's totally available as an open source project. Also, the Common Vulnerability and Exposure Database, you've seen it if you do vulnerability scans, the CVE, CVE the CV level and the documentation there. That was defined in the SCAP documentation version one. Then we actually had another development, the Open Checklist Interactive Language and OSIL version two, that was defined in SCAP version 1.1. The Trust Mod Model for Security Automation of Data, TMSAD, TMSAD, which is done in version 1.2. When we look at software asset management, the technology includes the following. We've got a software inventory in your organization to make sure that you are legally using that software. It is actually on your list and you've paid for that. There's also a different type of licensing, which we'll touch on a little bit later. We could have a license manager. If you do use, once again, let's actually look at Adobe Acrobat. You might have uh, 100 licenses and using that license management it will tell you if you're actually exceeding or getting close to that. We have software metering, and this could be anything from uh, how often we use software, how we're by heavy users, and so on. Application control could be, for example, I can actually restrict. Now, if we dig a little bit deeper in a product specific, like Azure, I can actually have a group that uses the development environment. And in that process, I can assign users in that application control group to say these five people actually can use the development tools uh, or using Microsoft Visio or project and so on. Software deployment is a process we can automate as well. It can be integrated into a patch management process or sometimes integral into the architecture for the control framework. Patch management is critical and there should be just enough and this whole patch management process we will look at later in the operation section there's request management process within software asset management for a user that request to use software the management approval process and then the deployment and then also a product catalog and this is sometimes we see that an organization may have a catalog which says these are approved software that is supported if you want to use any software that is not in our list you can either not use it request a specific dispensation or it is not supported now within each application we need to know every vulnerability the risk level of each vulnerability in my business process the patch level of every application do we have to patch it is it critical if we can't patch it, what is a compensating control and who is the custodian of that application? Now, also, when we look at the software asset management lifecycle, very similar to the actual IT time, we also have the plan and design. We have the procure, develop, and specifically when we look at the final domain, which is software development security, this is where we look at should we build it? Should we have COTS, COTS, or commercial off-the-shelf systems. Once we've done that, we commission it. We're going to, then the next stage is we're going to monitor usage. Then we're going to management and support the opti uh, software. And then finally, optimization, how many software. So if the user doesn't use an application adequately, then we'll actually move it to somebody else. And then finally, a retirement or renewal of those licenses. Then the type of licenses that we actually have, we can have a commercial license. This is the most common license which you have in your organization. If it's a very small company, you have educational license. So if you are a student, you can actually have student discount. Microsoft Word, for example, Office Suite, you can actually do that. You have an enterprise or site license, which means you m might pay for, say, a bulk of a thousand licenses, maybe, but you may, and you get it at a much uh, lesser discounts. So you've got the number of seats that you purchase. There's also this subscription or the cloud-based, uh, TurboTax, uh, Adobe, very good example, Microsoft Office 365, another example. Then we have 
three basic small ones freeware that's software that's in, in that you can actually use it's free you don't have to do anything and give anybody anything else there's also shareware which is not so common these days but it is basically saying you can use it for 30 days uh, winzip is an example and if you do like it purchase it otherwise you know don't use it and then finally software that is placed placed in the public domain now this is an interesting one because uh, if you place software in the public domain, you lose all rights to that software. So you can create it and so on. And then it's out there. People can use it and abuse it as they want. If you look at two, two different licenses from the Linux um, operating systems, you have the GNU or the GNU type license and also the BSD or the Berkeley Sockets license where the Berkeley socket says and they also have the Amazon and Google licenses which are also in similar in that it says here's a software it's yours you can do with what you want you can modify it and use it where GNU on the other side is it's it's a little bit more restrictive where they say here's the software you can use it you can develop you can improve it but anything that you do to it to improve it and so on you have to give it back into the public domain or in, into the GNU license agreement then we need to protect the privacy of all our assets within our organization. It becomes quite difficult when we look at a global perspective. We have, for example, cross-border data flow protection and privacy. Now, in America, the U.S., we have this safe harbor transition through the privacy shield. There's some movements around that to control it even a little bit better. We had the previous in the EU, we have the Data Protection Act, the DPA, which has developed into the GDPR. And that's all in Europe. And then finally, in the Asia-Pacific Economic Corporation Cross-Border Privacy Rules. Now, drilling a little bit deeper into the American side, we can actually look at there are things like some United States data privacy and guidelines. We have the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the FCRA. We have the Graham Leach Biley Act, GLBA, which is also from the Financial Modernization Act of 1999. And then also we have the NIST SP special publication 800 documentation 122, which defines the PII or the personal identifiable information. And that PII, you need to understand for the exam, what does it contain? For example, the name of the user, the, uh, his address, medical information. And then also there's the fair information practice principles. And in Canada, we have the Personal Information Protections and Document Act. Now, when we look at the data, we actually have different type of owners. We have the data owner or the data steward. Those are usually users They are seen as the same for the exam. The data owner has complete control on the data and can grant and revoke access. Then the data controller, that's an interesting one because it's a natural or legal entity, agency or body that determines the purposes of processing that data. And then you have a data processor, which is a sub of the data controller. It's usually controlled. The data processor is controlled by the data controller, which performs data ma manipulation on behalf of that data controller. And data custodian, that's the implement processes in partnership with the data owner or the steward. An example there is a, you may have a backup custodian of the data, which is not the owner of the data, but it's a process or a function within your enterprise that would actually perform that function. Now data, it might be data issues that we have to worry about when we look at the protection of the privacy. There's a thing called data remnants. Now I'm going to go through this definition which is from Wikipedia which defines the following that the data remnants is the residual representation of digital data that remains even after the attempts have been made to remove or erase the data. This residue may be from data being left intact by a nominal file deletion operation, by reformatting of storage media that does not remove data previously written to the media, or through physical properties of the storage media that allow previously written data to be recovered. Data remnants may make inadvertent disclosure of sensitive information possible should the storage media be released onto an uncontrolled environment. A very quick note on that file deletion for example if you've got the file allocation table or ntfs and you delete a file into the dos or ntfs or fat fat 32 
environment by deleting a file you don't delete the file what happens is you actually the operating system will take the first letter of that file and just replace it with an at sign so it doesn't delete the file just mark it as deletion so it's very easy to recover now also if you have if, uh, a usb drive for example and you format it there's two different types of formats you have a quick format a normal format and then you have destructive formats with specialized tools a quick format again is just uh, fiddling with the file location table and it's, you have to go and destroy this data if it has to be done. There's a couple of ways of we can destroy that data. For example, we, we can overwrite it. There's a utility called DBAN, which is, I think, disk, Dan's disk disabled it, this banner, which has got a couple of features that you can actually overwrite the data using ones and zeros and random. And it goes quite deep what DNSA might require. You can degauss it, which is a physical device that actually creates a magnetic field. Years ago, when you actually had tape, magnetic tapes that recorded telephone conversation or transactions, if you wanted to erase the device fully for either to use it further or to actually decommission the device so the tape can be destroyed physically or thrown away, that device would be used, a degausser. Now, you can also encrypt the data. So if a USB drive or a mobile hard disk, removable hard disk goes missing or gets stolen, the data is at least protected. And then we can also destroy the media or media destruction. We can physically destroy it. Uh, old CD-ROMs, you could actually snap them in half. There were some uh, shredders that actually could shred them or make little holes in them. We can do chemical altering, for example, put the uh, paper into a chemical uh, form, liquid, which would dissolve it. We can have phase, phase transition, for example, in the picture we see there, there's from a solid to a liquid to a gas to a plasma, and that's phase transmission. So SSD will actually put them in an oven and actually uh, go from a solid to uh, evaporate them. And also in tapes, for example, we can actually do raise the temperature above a Curie point. Now, Curie is a definition of where the device or the tape becomes unusable. Now, once we actually destroy the data, another impact or important thing we need to look at is data sovereignty. Now, data sovereignty is the idea that data are subject to the laws and governance structures within the nation it is collected. The concept of data sovereignty is closely linked to the data security, cloud computing, and techno technological sovereignty. Cloud computing, very important here. For example, if you look at a country in Africa, Tanzania would define that the data of the users should be in the country itself. So you cannot create a, a cloud environment where all the data is exported, to, for example, to, the, to Europe or America. Also, when we look at that, it says that the common criticism of data sovereignty is brought forward by corporate actors that it impedes and has the potential to destroy processes in cloud computing. Since cloud storage may be dispersed and disseminated in a variety of locations at any given time, it is argued that the governance of cloud computing is difficult under data sovereignty laws. For example, data held in the cloud may be illegal in some jurisdictions but legal in others. Then there are the legal requirements for the data that we actually have. There are things called data location or residency. This is some governments have the requirement to store such data only within the border of said country. As I mentioned, Tanzania is a very good example. Collection limitation. This is legal. Only collect what is required for the process. So you're not allowed to just grab data if you can get your hands on it. And there's different states of data. For example, data at rest. For example, on a hard drive or USB sitting in your desk, data in motion, so trans transferred from your PC to the server or to a data or to the cloud, and then data in use, so it might be downloaded from a server from the cloud and it's currently on your machine and being processed by a data processor. Then also we can look at some emerging threats in the environment. There's incorrect configuration of cloud endpoints. We've seen a lot of data disclosure that happens all over the world because somebody actually uh, created an Amazon back, uh, bucket, they actually put the data in there and they forgot to close the access and it's just incorrect configuration. Now what you can actually do there, there's a new 
in 2020, there's a new framework that actually was released. And I would actually really suggest that to look at the documentation. It is in the links on the actual uh, handouts that you have. It's called the NISD Privacy Framework version 1. Now, once we've done that, we need to look at it to ensure appropriate asset retention. What does that mean for me, for my enterprise? There are certain requirements on looking at data. There are things called record retention acts. Now, this is different from country to country. For example, HIPAA, which is a medical insurance practice uh, guidelines we have, says a six years requirement of data should be kept. There's a whole life cycle around the records retention. And then good practice you can look at is the NIST Cybersecurity for IoT program, the Internet of Things program, and also the ISO 27017 released in 2015 called Cloud Practices. Consideration must be when we do forensic examination, so that data might need to be kept longer for evidence purposes. And then criminal data may not be stored where it's illegal. Now, a very good example I can get to here is that an investigator working for a television program were caught with child pornography uh, at his house and he said he's keeping that for a study or a project he's busy doing. And as you can understand, that is illegal. It's like keeping cocaine at your house, saying, oh no, I'm doing actually a project on cocaine, so it's not illegal. Now, looking at this data, once we look at the retention, we need to determine the data security controls. Now, there are different control types we can actually look in the data. There are the preventative controls. This prevents of unwanted occurrence from happening. We have detective. So this will actually detect if something happens illegally. Hopefully, it's monitored somewhere. We can react on that. Corrective resets the status quo to the desirable state. For example, if my application or my data is modified using unauthorized or legal modification by, for example, malware, you might have a program to replace that data or, or put it in quarantine and recover it. We have deterrent to discourage security anomalies from occurring. This could be labels. As an example, looking at my data to be say, listen, this is classified as secrets, only for your eyes only. Uh, recovery control could be restored resources capabilities after the event has normally occurred. And then finally, there's compensating controls, which means it's additional controls that I've put in place if my inherent controls or my applica applied controls based on standards is not adequate enough. And I can quickly go through some uh, administrative examples from each one of these. For example, we have directive, preventative, detective, corrective, and recovery controls here. And when we look at management or administrative examples here, a directive might be a policy. A preventative might be a user registration or user agreement, a non-disclosure agreement. That is preventative because if somebody signs a non-disclosure agreement, they'll think twice before they actually disclose the data. Detective, review my access logs, job rotation. There can be investigations. So if people realize we, it's going to be investigated quite often, they'll actually won't commit the crime. There's also security awareness training. Corrective controls may include things like a penalty, administrative leave, so I'll make sure that users are forced to take at least 10 working days consecutively per year as leave because when that happens, usually if they were committing a fraud, it will be identified. And there might be a controlled termination procedure. So if people either get fired all they resign, you need to understand the exit process. You need to actually understand why they left. Is it was actually a, a crime that was committed? Or the other uh, staff members that are bullying, for example, in quotes. And then finally, the recovery for the administrative example. We've got BCP and DRP, so the planning processes. Then also on a physical side, directive could be procedures. Preventative could be physical barriers and locks. So if you look at asset management, we can have a, a, a cabinet which actually have a physical lock or combination lock. There could be a badge system that all users have to walk around. We have security guards, man trap doors. Effective hiring procedures is a, is, a, is a nice one because often the process do fail there. So a person might become 
an employee, but you didn't have proper screening procedures. You might employ a criminal, which I've often seen with a criminal record, and they're actually working on data which is quite sensitive. Now, awareness training, preventative as well, because once we actually have awareness, the guys will not commit the crime. They say, listen, you can't go past that barrier because it is. Detective control, physical operational, we've got motion access sensors, motion detectors, and also closed circuit television. Now, corrective action in physical operational examples, an example here could be user behavioral modification. In a physical access control, approaching a building, you might see a sign that says, listen, don't step on the grass, follow this path. And the only reason why that is, is that forcing you as this user behavioral modification to ensure that when you walk, you actually walk where the cameras can see you. And also money for update physical barriers. Physical, I have in a recovery environment, reconstruct offsite facilities. In my technical examples, we can have a directive is a standard as an example. My, in my preventative, we can have user authentication, multi-factor authentication or MFA, access controllers, firewalls, intrusion prevention, and also encryption. Detective is where we detect things happening. For example, log access and transactions. We can do transaction monitoring. Store access logs, SNMP traps, so if somebody fiddles with a network or try to break in, we'll see that. IDS, which is intrusion detection, and then also message authentication coding hashes. And that we saw in the actual security engineering part of the encryption processes. Then also there can be corrective issues, for example, isolate or terminate connection when we see an intrusion. We can modify and update access privileges when the user required. And finally, a technical example for recovery is my backups, my system recovery functions, and my rebuild. And we actually have a baseline security finally. Now we have to establish a baseline. This is an ISO EEC 27005, which is a document that says Guideline for Information Security Risk Management. We can look at risk management, a document I highly recommend to read, which is the NIST SP 800-30, which is my risk management documentation, and also DISA or DISA, which is my Department of Defense, Defense Information System Security Agency. The links are also in the notes. We have scoping and tailoring. So for example, if we go to analysis and we look in the environment, but the business might require some modification of the actual baseline. This is scoping and tailoring. So based on my company requirement, my baselines are tailored. For example, I cannot have a 15 character password because the operating system only allows for eight. That's a tailoring of the actual baseline. There's also a standard selection, another document you have to be very comfortable with is the NISD SP 800-53, which is known as the security and privacy controls for federal information systems and organizations. Now, data protection and methods, we can look at things like backups, my DRP and BCP from our operation security we looked at, and then also encrypted from my security engineering. Now we have to establish, finally, the information and asset handling requirements. Now, what this means to me is that we actually may have things like marking and labeling, for example, data classification policies. This is also from an engineering when we look at things like the um, common criteria, my uh, uh, Department of Defense classification for my rainbow series. And then also there must be a policy for handling of my data. If it's critical, secure data, secret data, how do I actually book it out, book it in, and have a log of who's been accessing that data. We have to have transfer and storage of sensitive data. The policy should cover that as well. Then declassifying the data, there's a couple of ways we can do it. We can obfuscate or de-identification, also known as anonymization. So if I have a document, I need to remove all identifiable information from the document. For, for example, if it was a client we looked at, we need to make sure that all client references are out there for when I publish that in a environment that uh, may require that. And then also highly what we need to look at, and that's also from operations we saw that, where we have storage solutions, for example, my network addressed, um, attached storage, and also my arrays, and my SAN, and also federate file systems. Now this actually contains basically a small domain, and you went through that. 
what I suggest your next step around this is to actually look at a couple of formal frameworks and documentation and how that applies to the data. One thing I can highly recommend is the NIST cybersecurity framework. Go through the actual step-by-step -step what you have to do, the critical security controls, my open web application security project, and also the reference NIST SP800 documents noted. It is a small domain, but it is actually critical to have the assets done adequately before we do things like my business impact analysis. We're going to start the business um, resumption of the business compensating controls. We have disaster recovery. And all this is critical to have the assets. If you fail in the assets, it's a domino effect. We fail of many others. Now, after the section, the next section will actually go through a sample questions and debate those questions of how to approach these things in your environment.